if you read the papers or watch the news or listen to the radio or surf social media, it seems that we medics and medical scientists are incredible, which of course we are. Almost every day there's a new operation, um, a new drug, a new piece of technology, a new cure or a new cause for something. You'll find the best foods to eat and those you should simply avoid. Now, it, it seems that there is this rapacious public attitude for health and medical stories. And of course, the media are uh, a leading source of health information um, for the public and, and the way in which public health messages can get distributed as well. Now, some of the reporting is frankly excellent, but quite a lot of it that I'm sure you'll recognize or may have seen um, is sensationalized hype um, and often based on inadequate information or biased information or false information, some of it poorly researched. How do you know when you read stuff or watch stuff what's true and what isn't? Now tonight I'm going to discuss um, the importance of medicine to the media and vice versa. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to consider what is or what is not newsworthy. I'm going to look at potential conflicts of interest uh, the pressures on those people involved, both journalists and scientists, and think how we, the public, uh, might better interpret what we read, see, or hear. And I'll also think about what impact social media is going to have on all of this. Now, the basis of the relationship that, as a doctor, I have with a patient is one of trust. It depends on us, individual doctors, uh, telling the truth first to ourselves and then to each other. When that truth is questioned, the trust breaks down. Now, at the moment these days, it seems that truth is rather a fluid concept. And in the era of fake news, the truth is at risk, and I would argue even in medicine. What is news? Uh, there's one workable definition which appears in lots of... Um, pieces about journalism, and it's this, that anything that interests a large part of the community that's never been drawn to their attention before. It's different from information, which is a, you know, uh, resolves uncertainty, if you like, or provides the answer to a question. And it's certainly different from knowledge, uh, which gets, signifies deeper understanding or insight. Now, what the media choose to cover may not only satisfy this public appetite, for medical news, but it can also, and indeed does, affect and sometimes drive both policy from the government and healthcare decisions more generally. Unfortunately, with the huge increase in both news and available medical information over the last decade or so, it's not necessarily associated with increased knowledge or and certainly not increased insight. I'll give you an example, I want to tell you a story. When I uh, was doing my doctorate in Newcastle as a senior registrar, I was interested in how you make cardiac surgery safer for patients with diabetes. And we had to use this um, rather clumsy machine you see on the left, which was an early artificial pancreas, um, which continuously measured blood glucose and then infused insulin intravenously to keep the blood glucose in a narrow band. Um, you, we had to program the damn thing, calibrate it, take blood samples every few minutes um, over a 24-hour period while we looked after the patients. Um, we Somehow, our local journalists got hold of what we were up to and came in to see what we were doing. And they spent the better part of a day with us and took a bunch of pictures and asked us a lot of questions about what was involved. And we thought we'd done a really good job explaining what it was all about. Two days later, a double-page spread appeared in the paper with this headline. Um, and the photograph was of a patient being transferred from the operating room to the intensive care unit, wrapped in a space blanket rather like these ones. Uh, there was no picture of the artificial pancreas and little discussion about the control of blood glucose. The article had completely missed the point and created a new breakthrough of its own tinfoil treatment. The news had become tinfoil treatment. The information about the dangers of diabetes undergoing cardiac surgery was hidden, and the knowledge, the insight about what could be done to mitigate that risk was missed completely. 
Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, I've retained a healthy skepticism of what I read in the media about medical advances ever since. So let's think for a minute about what is medical news. Well, let's start looking at the research side of that. M medicine might be inherently interesting, but it's built on cumulative research and innovation and has a slow development. Um, we, we use a series of experiments over time, accumulating experiences and accumulating data. Doubt and uncertainty are the norm in our business, and research findings are always tentative. We're used, as scientists or doctors, to think in probability rather than certainty. Absolute truth emerges over time, like the picture in a complex jigsaw puzzle, but we rarely find that elusive last piece. We communicate with each other in, in scientific journals and at meetings and are used to qualifying our findings to each other, sharing doubt. A public media piece, on the other hand, must be readable, almost absolute, and uh, in the eyes of a journalist, something which seems um, bright and shiny can seem like dumbing down to the scientist who did the work. Our cautious, gradual approach seems like old news, far less dramatic than some uh, acute, dramatic story of new news. Especially if the journalist is a generalist and has been more used to the principles of general news reporting. Now, um, uh, these people are famous, and um, there's a sort of checklist that is classical in the news media that you go through these questions when you write an article about famous people uh, in order to make sure that you've covered all the issues. And that's core to the concepts of general news reporting and the rest being let's have some good anecdote and use your reporting skills to make a good story. Tim Johnson in his Shattuck lecture at the end of the last century uh, contrasted that with medical news reporting. Uh, where, as I said, it's a slow burn of information, where it's all about doubt, and you need to really understand what's going on in the way the study is designed, realistically to be able to criticise it or publish it. Maybe you need some specific training as a journalist to be good at that. This is Tim Johnson. He was um, a television doctor with ABC News in the United States, um, and was very good natural communicator, and he had a brilliant way of describing his job, which I'll share with you. <laughs> now, in the UK, we're used to public service broadcasting and put pretty well great store by the concept of its independence and its editorial integrity. But we mustn't forget that that's not the same goal in the commercial media where it's there to make a profit. News forms part of a business plan, and medical news is profitable. A media owner is concerned about the reach of their newspaper, the readers and the population of readers that they face, and particularly, if you like, the social class of those A, B, C, D, so that they can target advertising to generate advertising revenue and get more money for the shareholders. Um, the first page, the front page of a, a newspaper is um, being described as the most coveted real estate in journalism because it attracts, like in this paper, high cost advertising. And incidentally, it also has all the words that I'm gonna draw your attention to later that you don't want to see in a medical report. But health news sells. It may increase readership, and this real estate makes real money through the advertising re revenue. Now, interestingly, the stories that you come across in the mass media uh, are surprisingly, given the way we all talk about bad news selling, um, that uh, and the medical stories are overwhelmingly positive. It's good news that sells medical um, articles, much to everyone's surprise, I think. It's probably worth considering, then, where the stories that we see, hear, and read come from. Uh, they draw on an enormous range of sources to create the news. There are uh, uh, innumerable medical journals, and uh, we have lots of international meetings to discuss our findings. The media, once they obtain these stories, can then frame the news or set an agenda. And by framing, they're covering selectively certain topics, 
um, telling us facts, covering controversies. For agenda setting, they're picking out individual issues um, and at the exclusion of others in order to uh, change policy and practice. That's an editor's decision. Picking the right story is tough. They've not only got to find the story and collect and collate the information, but tell us a story. And um, everybody in the business has to exercise considerable judgment to make sure it's the right one. Johnson described it as the U2 syndrome. If the editor, the anchor, or the chief reporter becomes interested in something, then you too, the public, must be interested as well. Another producer said, you've got to have a hook. News selection is what it's all about. You need to uh, get your article into the paper, past the editor, and to do that, you need a good story. Sensationalism is the easiest way, something that's really major, like a massive epidemic. Something new, especially if it's associated with technology. Something controversial. Something that's directly affected your known audience, and newspapers these days know their audiences very well. Something that has local involvement with identifiable people or an individual. And if there's a moral or ethical dilemma, that helps. And if you've got a single, gripping, personal story about an individual, that's really useful to get it in there. Now, the problem with sensationalism is the risk of overemphasis. Recent new health hazards tend to be overreported in the mass media. We look up here, um, SARS, and this is from 2003, SARS and bioterrorism were associated with a tiny number of deaths worldwide. But look at the amount of media reports that they got covering them, whereas inactivity and smoking were associated with massive numbers of deaths and hardly any media reports. Now, it would be disingenuous to say that the media hadn't had something to do with our changing attitudes to smoking and AIDS, but those were public health strategies in which the media was initially an unwilling and later a willing partner. So our public perception of risk is biased by the overestimation of small probability events, amplified by media coverage. And reporting uh, particular areas of science is heavily influenced by um, political and politics and celebrity. Here's a, an example of that looking at spinal injury. That's the number of publications on the vertical axis. And this is when Donald, um, one of the first Bush, restricted research into stem cell signing, a sudden boost in uh, publications. And this is when Christopher Reeve, who was paralyzed, if you remember, died. And there was another great flush of publications about this. So they, the, the politics and the celebrity are going to influence what you read. Much of the news that the journalist um, is drawing on is actually quite derivative. They come from stories that they might get on the wire, uh, from other newspapers, especially if they're abroad, um, from direct personal contacts within medicine, and of course from our professional journals and the meetings that we go to to share our findings. But there's been a big change in uh, the recent two or three decades where the whole process of university research and medical research is becoming increasingly commercialized. There's huge competition for research funding and for institutional kudos amongst hospitals, uh, universities, and grant-giving bodies. As a result, each of these is delivering a huge number of press releases which the poor journalist has to somehow filter way through. That's the journalist's job, or at least it ought to be, to filter good stories from all of this garbage that's coming their way. And it's not just press releases. The bigger charities have press centers where there's an, a very huge amount of resource available online for them to go and look at stuff that can be used for news, especially on a quiet news day. These have ready-made case studies so that there's stuff ready for the journalists to use. Um, there are various blogs that come from charities, hospitals, research laboratories, and individual scientists providing yet more content. And institutions like my own um, also put out stuff they think will be of interest to the media. It's fantastically useful, but there's a huge danger of all of this that it lends itself to cutting and pasting. It's relatively easy to revamp a press release for your own copy. 
uh, which is great as long as the press release is good. Um, journalists who do this have been given a wonderful name by Christy Wilcox as journalists, um, which I rather like, I must say. Not only are press releases a marvelous uh, resource for a journalist to choose from, but they're also open to abuse and not just by the lazy or uncritical journalist. There's a big problem of ghostwriting of press releases. Uh, and these can be designed deliberately to mislead an uncritical or busy journalist. Media releases from large pharmaceutical and medical equipment corporations are often handled by specialist PR companies, of which, incidentally, there are over 250 engaged in this worldwide, not the scientists themselves. The scientists aren't giving out the press release. It's modified by the people who sponsor the work. It's expensive, and the motivations behind this need to be questioned. Unfortunately, scientific papers turn out sometimes to be ghostwritten. At the turn of the century, um, scientists were exposed as taking pretty significant sums of cash uh, for papers which had been ghostwritten by the drug companies themselves. So they became an author on the paper, but the company who was sponsoring the study had written the paper. And uh, sometimes the scientists hadn't even seen the raw data. Sarah Bosley um, famously described this as a high-class form of professional prostitution, which we should all be ashamed of. Our press releases can have a really interesting and important effect on the stock market prices um, of these individual companies. So if a uh, drug company, for example, in these, um, these examples, releases um, a positive trial, this, this drug seems to work in the published trial, then the stock market price goes up and is sustained for a long time. If, on the other hand, it's a negative trial, the stock market price drops and stays down. So it's absolutely in the interests of the companies involved to control the flow of information. Company press releases, therefore, are almost always highlighting the positive benefit and many would interpret this as bias. Now, sadly, it's not just press releases from um, interested parties in a drug company sponsoring a trial, but the universities themselves. This was looked at recently, and in the press releases from 20 recognized UK universities, uh, more than a third had significantly exaggerated claims. It's hard for us to criticize the media reporting if we can't get it right ourselves, if we are not telling the truth. Press officers are highly reliant on scientists to uh, check the accuracy of the copy and to the balance and to the balance of these press releases. But if they won't look at them, don't criticize them, and allow it to go out, then the risks are incredible because. Uh, if the press release is exaggerated, so is the news, news piece which follows. You don't need to see much about this graph, but this column is all of the press releases which were exaggerated, and the white column shows that the subsequent news item was exaggerated as well. So if you exaggerate the press release, the news item will be exaggerated as well. Journals issue press releases, which the... Um, or a journalist has to fiddle through. And it's in their interest to increase their own exposure or circulation, and there's good evidence that it works. The New England Journal is one of our most respected journals in medicine internationally. And in 1991, uh, they reported that those of its papers which were covered and picked up by the New York Times received more citations in the medical literature over the next 10 years than those which had not been reported, and 80% more citations in the first year. So it's really good for my academic career if the paper is picked up by the general media. And what they choose to pick up may not necessarily reflect what's important. There are other ways in which industry tries to get news out. And this has been called stealth advertising and uh, they will employ third-party experts or public relations departments who are very good at giving misleading names to such connections. So grassroots organizations is what they often associate with industry-funded lay patient groups. 
doctors who've been wined and dined or recruited to industries, um, speakers bureaus get called key opinion leaders. Um, celebrities or politicians who endorse products are called grass tops. And they organize disease recognition meetings, which is something I hadn't particularly come across. But in these, they're trying to build the image of the disease. Tell us more and more about the disease. And the poor journalist who's invited to it could easily be unwittingly uh, find themselves um, giving out false information to a gullible public. To my mind, it's essential that journalists investigate possible conflicts of interest uh, amongst anybody promoting a new idea or therapy. Now, they can be really hard to identify, but exposing them is clearly in the public interest. Um, when the guidelines um, for the management of high blood cholesterol were developed um, by the NIH, Newsday reported that eight of the nine clinicians involved in developing the guidelines had financial links with the statin industry. The old journalistic motto of follow the money never seemed so apposite. And I think it's worth remembering. Not all research studies are created equal and good medical reporting needs the journalist to be able to spot rubbish. Tim Johnson thought that um, maybe all medical journalists should have significant training. And that's not an unreasonable argument. After all, our weathermen do. They're meteorologists, and uh, shouldn't we treat our health with equal respect? But life isn't easy for these journalists, and I think it's important that we consider the pressures on them, especially in the commercial media. Everybody wants a scoop, the journalists, the editors, the owners. And everybody's competitive, and no one wants their story to be nicked by another newspaper or another outlet. The pressure is on. And there are the classical media constraints which anybody who works against a deadline will understand of um, having to uh, be quick, make your piece small and simple. And if you're doing that in the face of the massive numbers of uh, press releases and journals that are coming at you as well, and trying to keep up with what's new, that's a great challenge. Not only have you got to find and read and check your story, but you've also got to um, find the human interest, get some second opinion to see if it's uh, sensible or not, and then get it in front of the editor. Um, and the editor, remember, is under significant financial pressures in the commercial media to make sure that what gets into the newspaper fits in with the demographic of the audience and any uh, potential advertising revenue that can be associated with it especially on the same page. So the daily schedules of a journalist are going to be really, really hardly pu hard pushed to get it then past the sub-editor, who will write the title probably, uh, and uh, get it ready for the deadline that's coming along. Now, the role of the article title uh, is usually modified by a sub-editor, and the title is particularly important. Uh, I had a conversation with Chris Smythe from The Times, who um, drew my attention to the fact that in the modern era, digital media allow you to look at what your audience is doing in a way that we couldn't do with just ordinary written media. And they know in The Times that the median time taken to read an, a medical article is 15 seconds, which means that people are just reading the headline and first paragraph. And only a small percentage of people go on to read the whole article in The Times. Remember that the headline may be not chosen by the journalist. It could be, it most likely be a sub-editor. So the title and the first paragraph are critical. And uh, as an example of that, this is my uh, friend Pr Chris van Hacht in uh, Leuven in Belgium, who is an expert in human factors in hospital care. And he was interviewed about the impact of medical accidents in hospitals on those who were caring for the patients who suffered the accident, so the staff who were involved. They, they've become known as second victims because they really suffer badly and need care and attention to make sure um, that they recover well. When the interview was published, its emphasis was totally altered by the sub-editor's choice of headline, which was this, translated very badly from the Flemish. 
Chris is absolutely sure because he knows the journalist that this was what, not what the journalist intended and clearly not the message that Chris was trying to get over. It almost created a third victim, which was the truth and also frightened the public when it didn't need to. Now this rather unsavory bunch of people are researchers apparently. And um, scientists are more used to a cautious approach as we've said, but um, these researchers work in, a prince in an environment where they have to publish or be damned. If they don't publish in scientific journals, they won't get career advancement. They also have to deal with a press office which wants to get their story out uh, for all the reasons that I discussed before. It's good for the institution, good for the grant-giving body, and might bring more kudos. They have to make themselves available, even if they're nervous about it, uh, in order that some of them may have to take a media appearance. And these media appearances can be quite seductive um, and not infrequently have led to exaggerated claims of what the research is all about because that's how you're encouraged to present the story by the journalist on the television or the radio. And of course that's followed not infrequently by sniping from colleagues or overt jealousy for being on there. But it's, it's interesting as I sit looking at people applying for jobs these days that many of the medical CVs that I look at have a section which says media appearances. That's new. It's an, seen as an achievement. Chris van Hucht, again, has described this as a media impact factor, an unwritten impact factor, uh, which seems to have value nowadays. It may well be a career advantage or an institutional advantage, um, but it's undoubtedly risky. As I said, it's very hard to get away with exaggeration and simplification in the scientific community, but it's almost rewarded in the television studio especially if you're on a tiny slot on breakfast television. It's easy to misspeak because you're nervous and you're encouraged uh, to make a sound bite. There's pressure to entertain and to simplify. Yet if we accept that the mass media do have an important role to play in the dissemination of news about health and about advances in healthcare, there's not really much point in ignoring them and certainly no point in treating them as the enemy. Accurate communication is the job of a scientist in a way and it's the same job for the media, maybe not always accurate. Um, Liesk and his colleagues have, have come up with some useful advice for any scientist it works in a number of ways, this any field really, if you're forced to communicate with journalists. First is to uh, consider the timing. If you're going to speak to them, speak to them in the morning. It's a good way to get into the daily news cycle. Make yourself available so that you can help with explanation, accuracy and background. Don't say no. Have some resources already available, pre-prepared text, video, audio, that can save time and improve the accuracy with which you deal with the journalist. And give them that personal anecdote, the personal story, or like those um, grant giving bodies, have some inverted commas tame patients who are willing to go and speak to the media. Keep them in your network so you can speak to them and know who they are. And most of all, help them with the ethics of what they're doing so that you can kind of keep them on track. Um, we've got to live up to our ethical standards to make that a realistic assumption. And, and as we've said before in these lectures, and that's not always the case. Now, um, I, want to, uh, <clears throat> I want to talk uh, now a little bit about um, misinterpretation. Um, this classic quote from Disraeli, or attributed to many others as well, um, reflects not only a systematic distrust of statistics, but our recognition that they can be manipulated. And also a widespread ignorance, I think, about how uh, they can be interpreted. And yet, all of medical research is completely dependent on appropriate study design, high quality measures, and the proper selection and application of statistical methods. Otherwise, how can you interpret the results? Now, you'd think that uh, medics would be good at this stuff, but it turns out from a study done in India recently 
that pretty well half the medical students and faculty of significant number of institutions couldn't sort out the most basic kind of statistics. So if we can't do it, how can we expect the general public to do it? And this, I think, is quite um, alarming, first of all. I hope it's not universally true that this is the situation, but it's worrying and needs to be considered. It may perhaps explain why statistics are rarely reported with medical stories in the media. We're much more likely to get statistics presented in politics and business than we are in health, where it's only 8% of stories which have significant description of the statistics involved. People revert to words. And, and maybe it's not surprising because people struggle with even the most simple concepts of risk. Um, researchers asked a pop large population in the USA and in Germany which of these values carried the highest risk. More than 25% of people failed to recognize that one in 10 was the highest risk and thought that this was the highest risk because the thousand is a bigger number, a quarter of the population. Not surprising that if you put these numbers into paper, people will misinterpret what they see. And that doesn't even tell us about important things like relative and absolute risk. Relative risk, as you often see in, in um, newspapers, is, for example, people who use sunbeds are 20% more likely to develop a malignant melanoma. But 20% of what? 20% of 0.0001 is not very much. Absolute risk tells you the real numbers. And relative risk uh, just gives you some indication of proportion. Much as I would love to give you lots of statistical examples, I don't have time and cannot do it. But my friend David Spiegelhalter has created a really brilliant website where you can um, play with a variety of graphic representations of risk. And I really recommend looking at this because it talks about this difference between absolute and relative risk, and also something called numbers needed to treat, which is a much better way of interpreting uh, many medical uh, papers. Many articles in the media, many pieces on the television, say that there's a strong correlation between something and something else. Correlation is not causation. Here's a good example of that. Uh, this is the amount of cheese that Americans eat per head per year, and this is the number of people who get tangled up in their bed sheets and die, which apparently is a cause of death. Um, they're closely correlated, but you'd have to be a complete moron to think they were in any way related. And yet the media will report these correlations quite frequently, and they are not causation. And trying to remember that when you read something is terribly important. Now, we are spared the problem of direct-to-consumer DTC marketing of prescription drugs in our mass media. This is another way in which Big Pharma gets information news out to the public. It's a big problem in the United States. DTC marketing, the budget of Big Pharma, is twice that of the FDA, the Federal Drugs Administration. The consumer is encouraged to ask their physician to prescribe them a particular drug, and there's a sort of superficial look at the evidence. And the drug is usually expensive, and this pressure is remarkably effective in increasing sales. It's only been in, able to do it since the mid-90s, and it works. Here is what um, uh, just a sort of small clip of the way in which Americans see this at every advertising break. Abilify. Five minutes. So with Advair. Crestor. Cymbalta. Enbrel. Humera. Intermezzo. Levomir Flex Pen. Lyrica. ADHD. It's my depression. COPD. But your erectile dysfunction. Bad cholesterol. Depression. Moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. Middle of the night insomnia. They're all glossy. They're much longer than this. And they are often very dangerous drugs. Um, and it's astonishing in a way that they can be advertised in this way. But it's a bit like um, the finance industry in this country because they also have to tack on to the end of these glossy advertisements something about the enormous numbers of side effects that they can get. And there's a wonderful parody which I'll show you now, uh, which I, I really think sums it up perfectly. 
Do you suffer from nose itch? Do you find yourself having to blow, wipe, even pick? These are symptoms of a common but serious condition called dried nasal mucus, commonly known as boogers. If you'd prefer to use a pill rather than a tissue, prescription superfluous helps to correct this problem. While taking superfluous, you may not be able to sleep, eat, drink, stand, sit, walk, smile, laugh, speak, function, breathe, or wake up. Other side effects include nausea, diarrhea, bloating, flatulence, weight gain, migraines, mood swings, drastic change in libido, frequent urination, fatigue, or in other words, pregnancy. <laughs> other, other side effects can include internal hemorrhaging, heart rupture, brain rupture, rabies, loss of eyesight or smell, loss of eyesight and smell, spontaneous combustion, and slow, horrific, painful, tragic, avoidable death. In rare cases, superfluous can cause dried nasal mucus to worsen, which can lead to asphyxiation. People who eat food should not take superfluous. If you commit suicide, discontinue use immediately and dial 911. Stop boogers today. Undermine the fact your doctor spent half their life in medical school, diagnose yourself, and ask him or her about the superfluous prescription drug, superfluous. I love that. And uh, you, 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 if anybody's been to the States and watched these advertisements, they will recognize that style immediately. And although we don't get hammered by DTC marketing very much in this country, I get regularly upset, sort of angry at the weekend and the color supplements, um, as I read the extraordinary claims for cosmetics that appear in the color supplements. These are, in essence, drugs for the skin. And they use unashamedly scientific terms, Q11 and all the rest of it. And the articles are, offer supposedly scientific data to support their claims, but a marketing magazine looked at um, a lot of advertisement pages and found that only 14% had anything approaching a scientific basis. 25% had a little bit of evidence that they might do something but 25% were outright lies. Now, how do they get away with this? Why is this accepted when there's so much fuss about us talking about scientific evidence for everything else that we do? And clearly, um, the argument is, I would say, advertising revenue trumps scientific evidence. I'm not sure I feel comfortable with what they're allowed to say, any more than I feel comfortable about what's said about nutrition. Similar suspicions clearly exist. There are fads which celebrities push, and um, we're all used to it. But nutritional research is incredibly complex and often oversimplified, so how can we sort out what's real and what isn't? It turns out that an enormous number of um, nutrition studies are funded by industry. It's always a good idea, as we did before, to say who paid for this, who benefits from this. I haven't got time again to go through lots of examples, but I can recommend this source, which is the Harvard School of Public Health, um, and it's listed in the handout, um, because you can go there and see which of these stories is real and which isn't. Let me turn to broadcast media. Television still dominates as a source of news in the UK, um, but it's declining, it's falling over the last four years. And the use of the internet as a, a source of news is increasing. Television and, and radio and newspapers are about the third of the market in this country. And there's overlap, of course, because people use more than one source. But there is extensive coverage of medical news on TV, and television doctors are commonly seen and become celebrities in their own right. Here are just a few. Mostly they're there because they're excellent communicators and they do act as a vital link between science and the public and if given time and space by their editors. But in some countries, maybe the majority of countries, there are daily syndicated medical television talk shows uh, like this one, which is Dr. Oz, some of you may have seen. He's a cardiac surgeon like me and he's worth a lot more. <laughs> The data he presents have been looked at and are, in, are very questionable. Only half of all the recommendations he made over a given period had any important evidence to back them up, and that included a case study. 
The evidence was frankly contradictory in 15%. The, the benefit was only quantified in a small proportion, and it was incredibly rare to disclose a conflict of interest. And television reporting often overemphasizes the rare and dramatic over the common and harmful because it suits the medium. And, and it does so not only because it's sensational, but because it's relatively easy to cover in a short time that's available for reporters. And in local TV, where most Americans get their news, it's much worse. Young or generalist journalists often end up delivering the medical news in um, short, ill-informed sound bites. The average story in a local news, medical news item in America gets 45 seconds. 45 seconds to tell you something about an important paper. And you're being told it by someone who doesn't actually know anything about it and hasn't been given the time to analyze it. There's blatant commercialism, a disregard for uncertainty, and little coverage of health policy. It's a huge risk. Now, um, broadcasters often invite people of opposing views to argue their case. They do so because it might be a duty, as it is for the BBC, to present balanced coverage, or because they want to use conflict uh, between two sides to make the issue interesting. That's a sort of Trump approach, isn't it? But it's important to hear all sides of an argument, that we would all like to do that. And um, we've got to remember, though, that viewers and listeners can easily be misled when one side is presenting something that's simply implausible or demonstrably untrue, um, as was the case with MMR and autism, where you will remember on the television and the radio after Andrew Wakefield's paper, which was retracted, uh, scientists who had overwhelming evidence that there was no link were put up against people who were passionate about the anti-vaccine argument, but with no scientific data to support it. And uh, recently, Nigel Lawson uh, um, got into a spat with Justin Webb um, over climate change. And the enormous amount of evidence that there is for climate change, which Nigel Lawson denied, was not pushed hard enough by Justin Webb and was seen to be an example of poor balance and fairness bias. This is Aaron Sorkin, who wrote um, that brilliant West Wing, uh, for those of you who've seen it on television. And he put it very well. I think this is a really good example of fairness bias. He said, if the whole uh, Republicans walked onto the floor of the House and said, the earth is flat, the headline in the New York Times the next day would be Democrats and Republicans can't agree on the shape of the earth. It doesn't matter that it's nonsense. If it's nonsense in general media, what must it be like on social media? Almost half the world uses social media. Billions of people. You uh, organizations and individuals have rapid access to an individual's um, mobile communications device. Social media form the dominant part of global, this is from a, a World Reuters report, the dominant source of news for uh, younger people, whereas older people like me still use television and very few around the world use radio and newsprint. It's a big change and it's changing quite quickly. I, as I read the um, Ofcom report about the UK, I was surprised to see that people were actually getting news directly by entering something, a question, into the Google search engine, into that little box. A question about news. Half the population don't trust, what the, don't trust the news that they read anyway, and only 18% feel that social media can be trusted. Maybe encouragingly, the under 35s who we've just seen dominate the use of the social media are those who distrust what they read the most. So maybe there's a bit of hope about that. But social media has obvious advantages. I mean, we uh, undoubtedly heard Mark Zuckerberg talk about those only yesterday. But the dangers are considerable and um, they're, they're appearing before you now. From my point of view, I think the poor quality of the information is the most worrying in the context of this talk. It's very difficult to identify the source. It's often not named. It's inadequately challenged. And the medical information that creeps out may be incomplete, anecdotal, or unreferenced. 
Scientific publication places little weight on anecdote, but broadcast media and, and the newspapers thrive on it, but social media magnifies it. Lacks like a megaphone. More so since any user can upload information to the site. Uh, the internet is a fantastic tool for the distribution of medical information and news. And in fact, all of the professionals I know use it to post information in one way or another. It's encouraging that the most um, trusted reports in 2013 and a big Price Waterhouse review were posted by doctors, nurses, and hospitals. Uh, makes you feel quite good, doesn't it? But that means almost half the population don't trust it, I suspect. <laughs> and anyway, who doesn't use um, Google? I do. I search for things in Google um, in the usual way, typing something into the box. But I also use Google Scholar and PubMed as access to the medical literature. And if you work for a university, you have Metalib that allows you to go and find the information very easily. PubMed, Google, and Google Scholar are available to all of you. And certainly in my practice, my patients and their parents use it all the time and emerge fully informed by the time they arrive in my clinic. But you've got to remember that in Google, what comes up top is weighted by advertising. Somebody have made, may have paid to get that information in front of your eyes. And when you do finally get through to the paper by the hyperlinks in all of those journals, you have a TLDR problem, too long, didn't read. Medical papers are hard to read and they're complicated and people will half read them or not read them and so they're left with the headlines of, of what they're doing and not much insight. So how can we cast a critical eye over what we find in the media? Well, fortunately, there are some resources out there. This is a website which hardly anybody knows about, sadly. It's called uh, Behind the Headlines. It's on the NHS Choices website. And uh, every day, they pick up the headlines from the newspapers and uh, then analyze it, give you the source material and a commentary. For example, this was in March. Brufen will wipe out dementia, says the sun. It would be nice if it did. Unfortunately, when it was analyzed as part of the process on the um, NHS Choices website, it turns out to be completely misleading. Poorly interpreted paper with created news, just like my tinfoil treatment all that time ago. Some newspapers have a, a reputation for uh, using dramatic headlines in medical news. And um, this was how Ben Goldacre in 2007 described uh, the Daily Mail, having a philosophic project of mythic proportions, working through all the inanimate objects of the world to find which ones both caused and cured cancer. They're in the middle of that project, I think. <laughs> so much so, there's a fantastic website. If, again, it's in your handout. If you go to this, you find yourself spending a disproportionate amount of time going over the headlines that the Daily Mail has put in the newspaper over the years. And not only are the inanimate, inanimate objects both um, curing and causing cancer, but usually both. There's a, a, another great resource of criticism in the United States. looks largely at their media, but it's freely available to us, called healthnewsreview.org. And they give a beautiful list of 10 things that in the ideal world the critic would look at to work their way through an article. It's, it's in your paper, so I won't read it. But it is useful. None of us have that much time. But if, you, if it matters to you, if you want to know whether the paper you're reading is true, it's really good. Or the article you're reading is true, it's useful to go through this list. For those of you who don't know what disease mongering is, it was a term christened in the early 1990s by Lynn Payer, who said it was uh, to define the process of convincing people who are well or at least asymptomatic that they require medical attention. So what have we learned this evening? Well, first, um, this is a big topic and an important one. And I think when I started to write about it, I hadn't realized quite how big. Otherwise, I'd have written my whole lecture series about it. Um, though, so I've left a, a, the written essay you have is longer and contains more examples and some links. The relationship between medicine and the media is complex. It seems. Almost everybody has an interest in it, 
and we feed and foster each other's interest. There's plenty of human interest stories in medicine and it overlaps a lot with politics and finance, so it's easy to see why it ends up in the public eye. But it, and it helps sell newspapers, so editors like it and owners like it. But there are cultural differences. Our slow medical science um, is at the different pace to the fast news cycle which it has to feed. Culturally, uh, you're dealing with a shorter attention span on the right-hand side than the left. Organisations and individuals, including hospitals, grant-giving bodies and universities, try to manipulate the media. And this is m done most professionally by big industry. I think the truth is at risk. And this is worse in the area of social medicine because it's not so well checked. To sort it out, I think scientists must tell the truth as much as possible. We should then help the media. And journalists should be critical and investigative, not trust what's given to them. But editors will edit. They will place the articles they want or that meet the needs of their owner in places and hide others. It's very distressing when you've worked hard on a, um, some science and a journalist comes and talks to you about what it is they want to publish and then spend ages with you writing something really good and it never gets published because the editor doesn't want it in the paper. We should be sceptical about what we read because an awful lot of it is not very good. But the tools are there to help us find the truth. And if we know where they are and we're encouraged to find them, then we can. NHS Choices, behind the headlines, healthnewsreview.org. But you need to have your antennae triggered if you're going to know that you should look carefully at something. And here are a bunch of words similar to the ones I showed you on that front page which should have you really worried. There is nothing in medicine that's so simple or so transforming that it can be described accurately by these terms. If you read them, I prescribe a large dose of salt. <laughs> now, um, many of the journalists I've met during my career have had incredibly high ethical standards, and I've come to respect them hugely. I love investigative journalism. They understand the importance of being informative and having some degree of social responsibility. They're naturally curious, they're suspicious, and they look for a truth within the story. Hopefully they can use these skills to see through the bullshit and dis deliver a clear, precise precy of the topic they're addressing. I like to think of good journalism as a critical friend of society in general helping, in our case, the public to see through bad science or bad medicine. People have suggested there ought to be a group of experts, sorry, Mr. Gove, in case you're there, um, to filter what gets released. Or perhaps scientists should actually work more closely with newspapers and they should employ more of us to look at that. Or maybe you should just make editors accountable for what they publish and for their content. The balance is really um, not very closely related between reward and accountability and consequence. It seems easier than it should be to publish rubbish and the consequences are few. And yet, in medicine at least, the truth is critical because our lives depend on it. We can be harmed by taking the wrong advice or doing the wrong thing. Unless we wish to exclude the public from this knowledge or from policy decision, we have to work with the media and not against them. And we need to understand them and their pressures and their goals. Otherwise, we won't be able to identify or respect that precious truth, which is what we, I think, should be searching for in our work. Now, this is my uh, last Gresham lecture, and I have tried in it to give you an insight into an amazing world in which I work and have had the honour to be part of for so many years. Um, I hope I've shown you not just what we do and why we do it, but also to introduce you to some of the ethical and economic and organisational, emotional, political issues we face and will continue to face. I hope it's interested you and uh, left you asking questions. It's done that for me. I've 
tried to pick topics which are on the edge of my awareness. So I've had to learn a lot, and it's been a huge privilege. But speaking to you um, has been a privilege all on its own, and I shall treasure that forever. So I would like to thank you for your attention over these last four years and for your loyalty in turning up regularly and say goodbye. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>